Community Viewpoint with John Pollock and Maria Hurst. And welcome once again to Community Viewpoint. I'm back and it's, it's me, John <laughs> Pollock. Uh, and uh, I won't be here next week. We'll have Sally uh, Kerr from the, uh, the Chamber of Commerce, so you'll get a break from watching me. Uh, we have the good fortune of having with us uh, this week uh, Daryl Lacey, the General Manager in Nye County Water District. And he's got a few other hats that he wears too, but that's, that's the nature of the beast in Nye County. So we uh, welcome Daryl to the show this week. You may have seen he was doing some writing lately. He was in the uh, Front Valley Times, uh, letters to the editor, uh, speaking about Senate Bill 81. But uh, what, after we, what do we have to talk about today besides that? Oh, there's probably plenty of things about water we can talk about. It's a uh, yes. pretty hot topic in my own town here lately. And uh, the uh, Groundwater Management Plan Advisory Committee has been meeting and got some uh, ideas moving forward that we'll be trying to get a handle on over the next couple of months. And you're at liberty to tell us about those things? It's all public meetings. We can talk about any of it. Yes. It's, uh, I would really wish more people would show up at the meetings. And uh, it's a uh, water, water's important to all of us. Uh, a lot of times it's after the fact, uh, like in a newspaper, we hear the comments there rather than at the meetings too. But that's the nature of the beast also. Uh, with with meetings also, so um, you don't have good participation, right? Well, the uh, volunteers who are appointed to the boards are always uh, pretty active and involved, mm -hmm. but getting general members of the public there to show up and give us their ideas and uh, work with us to help find positive resolution to some of these tough questions is what we'd like to see. The uh, and what are some of the the tough questions that we, we'd like to have answered? Well, the uh, state engineer was in town a couple of years ago. If y'all have heard us talking about it over the last uh, you know, since 2012, I guess the uh, front basin is called Basin 162 in the state engineer's parlance. It's what they call a hydrographic basin, which means it's uh, fairly well isolated from any of the other basins around here. So mm -hmm. all of the water that anybody within the Pahrump area uses uh, typically falls as precipitation up in the uh, Spring Mountains here over Mount Charleston. Flows down the mountains into the ground and we pump it out as groundwater. It's a, uh, we all share it. We've all got our straw into the same big gulp. So right. uh, we want to make sure that the uh, Water's not being wasted, it's not being contaminated, and that uh, there's uh, you know, water for everybody when they turn on their tap for what they need. And in the future also. Well, I'm thinking about the future. Well, and yes. that's one of the uh, real challenges that we have here is that we have um, today approximately 38,000 people in Pahrump. We've got uh, plenty of vacant land, uh, plenty of room to grow for as many as another two, three hundred thousand people, depending upon how we do our planning and uh, development for the future. And we don't have enough water to provide for that many people today. So we either find ways to uh, restrict growth, uh, do conservation to reduce how much water each person or each family is using, or uh, we find ways to import water from somewhere else, which is a real challenge. Right, because I had worked, uh, I remember Tom Bucco had some uh, theories on that also. Uh, one of the theories, well, probably you also, but uh, tapping the, the former Nevada test site also. We have some uh, applications that are on the uh, various parts of the Nevada test site for the areas that we think the water's not contaminated. Right. <laughs> yes. Uh, it's, it's a big place, so, I mean, uh, all the land and water at the Nevada test site is not contaminated, although there are areas where the uh, weapons testing went on that mm. the water is contaminated. That. We'll stay yeah. away from that, yes. but uh, the, uh, those applications have not been adjudicated. We don't know whether they will allow us to get that water or not. Some of them have been turned down, and we're appealing that ruling. So uh, 
there, there may or may not be water available for us there in the future. If it is, it's a fairly expensive thing to bring it to Pahrump. Uh, so it's a, it's a long-term possible solution. It's not a short-term solution to our issues here. One of the uh, things that um, I think is important for all of us is to help make sure that the growth pays for itself. Mm -hmm. So some of these solutions are expensive. Uh, we've been using things like impact fees and uh, other types of development agreements to help make sure that when new growth does come into town that these uh, new homes and businesses are helping to pay for the strains on our local infrastructure. So one of the, the theories was uh, zero growth or no growth would be one way to control it, but we've, we've had that with the, the recession. Now there's uh, more growth happening. We're having well, people move into the area. We are not over pumped today, at least valley wide from a uh, overall basin amount of water available. Perennial yield is the correct term. However, we do have areas in the valley, and you know we're over pumped because when your water levels are dropping in your wells. Mm -hmm. And there are areas of town where water is dropping one to two feet a year, which means in those areas of town, we are pumping more water than is available. So, you know, on the basin 162 as a whole, the uh, state engineer has determined that we have a perennial yield of 20,000 acre feet. Mm -hmm. And we're currently pumping around 14. And part of that 14 is agricultural use. So there's you know, definitely, I think, a long-term expectation that uh, the agricultural use will diminish and those, that pumping will be reallocated to municipal uses for human consumption. So uh, based on you know, right now at 38,000, we're using somewhere in the 10,000, 11,000 acre feet for domestic uses today. So we have uh, potential to double the population with the existing water supplies. Interesting. So uh, that's like I say, making some assumptions that the agricultural water use goes away. One of the key challenges we have is that we have a tremendous amount of excess paper water rights sitting out there. Yes. And those water rights give uh, <clears throat> anyone who holds one the ability to drill a well and pump that water that they have. Uh, today a lot of those water rights are not being pumped or only being pumped once every five years through the water law requires you use know, it use it, it or lose yeah. it doctrine. Yeah. So it's a, called a proof of beneficial use that people are having to do is that they at least once every five years they have to pump the water that they have a water right to or they can subject to losing that water right. Right. Um, so luckily all of that water that's reflected in those water rights is not being pumped in every in any single year. So we uh, like I say currently we have enough water. The issue is that anybody who looks at it is pretty much simple math to say that we don't have enough water for all the land that's here or for all the water rights that are here. So that's and, that's scary, yeah. And and the real purpose is to say that, you know, let's plan ahead so that we don't end up in a, in a real pickle here in 10 or 15 years because we haven't taken care of our business. All right, so how do we do that? That's part of what your job is. Well, I'm staff. I'm, I'm trying to, you know, at some level I'm just a subject matter expert. At some level I'm the one who's tasked with writing ordinances and helping to provide uh, backup information for the uh, meetings. The uh, Board of County Commissioners, the Water District Governing Board, and the Advisory Committee for the Groundwater Management Plan are the three groups that are truly going to be tasked with making the final decisions on these tough questions and tough, to say, tough areas. So what are some of the good plans, the good suggestions? Well, to I think some of the easier things are conservation related, uh, especially as we move forward. It's very difficult to go into an existing home and do major retrofits, but that sure doesn't mean that we cannot put in place building codes and standards that moving forward that people don't put in a lot of grass, don't okay. put in wasteful fixtures in their homes, things like that. So, and there's there's a balance there, but uh, the time when a home is built is when it determines kind of what the future water usage for that home is going to be. I had suggested to my builder to put a valve, because I have a two-story, 
to use the water from the shower, from the, the, the tub upstairs, to as plant water outside. And he said, ah, nobody ever tests it out here. <laughs> or also in the, the, the washroom downstairs to have a valve on that for the washer also. Well, you have to be careful. Though. You have to be careful. There's some building codes involved. But the concept you're talking about is we call beneficial reuse of effluent mm -hmm. is a generic term. And it's not only making sure that we could potentially identify some of that or catch your rainwater and use it, but also look at what's going through the sewer lines into the sewer plants and making sure it's being put to beneficial reuse. Mm -hmm. We've had some of that over the years with the golf courses being watered with effluent. Right. And the high school? Uh, is there have been some discussions with using effluent for some of the uh, high school. That's for the future for the, the future. Uh, Discovery Park, the uh, Willow Creek. Right. So right. that's some of the things that they're talking about there is using that effluent for that. We want to but do you it. can also put it into what's called a RIB, a rapid infiltration basin. I was just going to say that. Okay, cool. Yeah. <laughs> and once you put it into a RIB, the soil, I mean, one, it's treated fairly uh, extensively in a sewer plant mm -hmm. to begin with. Uh, when you put it into a rib, it percolates into the ground. The water is a great filter and bioreactor, mm -hmm. cleans it up, and uh, eventually that water ends up back in the, uh, the aquifer, aquifer where yeah. we can uh, reuse that water. So in general, the, you know, kind of a, in round numbers for a subdivision with smaller lots that uses central water and sewer, you know, somewhere around 40% of that water today is uh, recovered in the effluent and can be put back to reuse. So, mm -hmm. you know, your net water usage is primarily your uh, outside irrigation is where that goes. And one of the things here in Pahrump is that a majority of the water that we use in municipal uses here is outside. Mm -hmm. So we have to uh, try to help. And there's you know, conservation means a lot of things to different people. Uh, one of the things that's been discussed here fairly extensively is removal of salt cedars. Right. Uh, myself as part of the Southern Eye County Conservation District, that I spoke many years on that. And there's also the uh, Utilities Inc. also speaking about that right now with their ratepayers to remove salt cedars. They give um, a, a, a monetary incentive. Uh, to uh, remove the salt cedars also there. So we're just about out of time. We'll come back with Daryl in the second half. So thanks, and we'll see you in just a minute.